and uh, I'm excited to be partnering with you on uh, another one of these discussions. Susan, tell us a little bit about Thursday at three. Delighted to do so. Thank you, Steve, for inviting this partnership. Thursday at three started during the pandemic in an effort to stay positive. It's a collective effort. I run it like my own little cocktail party. Everyone is invited. It is free. It's an option, not an obligation. And the concept is to help one another be better versions of ourselves personally and professionally. Make no mistake, we do do business. We do lots of business online. It's uh, relax, reflect, and build relationships. The know, like, and trust that drives business. Everybody gets a copy of the chat and the contact information. Each week we have a theme and we reflect on it, relax and share information. And the theme for this week would have been celebrating life and it still is, but now we're celebrating it together with uh, Steve Gurney and with uh, Dwayne Hills. I love so it. Delighted to be here. All right, well, Dwayne, uh, jump on stage or uh, there. And uh, there, there he is, Dwayne yep. Hills, who is uh, the author of the brand new book, One Block West of the White House. And uh, Dwayne, we're going to talk about uh, the book, which Susan has right there, uh, almost 600 pages in length. And we're going to talk about your interesting profession. But before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about your background and what led to your current your career path well it's interesting because a lot of people would say why why would one choose the funeral profession <laughs> instead of being a fireman or a policeman um my curiosity started as a, about a 10 year old child I, my grandfather when he died uh we were taken to the funeral home as children dressed in our best and i can remember standing there and just staring at him in the casket and i thought if i stare long enough surely I'll see his chest move. <laughs> well, I don't remember if I ever did or not. But anyways, by my junior year in high school, when everyone else was deciding what their career path was going to be, uh, I went to the library. I had no idea. The librarian, Bonnie Miller, sat me down in front of the file cabinet of the career drawers. And I, had, I to this day, I still have this little booklet. I pulled this little booklet out that talked all about the funeral profession. And interestingly enough, I thought, wow, that's a, that would be a career that would be different every day. Um, probably no two days exactly alike. And I also knew, you know, in the environment that I grew up in, that the funeral profession, a funeral director, was a typically a well-respected person in the community. So I set my sights on it. I started investigating the different schools and possibilities. Ended up going to a mortuary school after community college. I went to a mortuary school in Syracuse, New York. Uh, and graduated. And the one thing that really sticks in my mind to this day was at the graduation ceremony, there were 40 kids, kids we were kids, most of us uh, in our class. And the dean of the school stood up there and said, congratulations, ladies and gentlemen, you're on call for the rest of your life. Well, and I'm thinking, what, what did he just say? <laughs> yeah. And how true that really ended up being for the most part. So, uh, but I've enjoyed my career. Uh, I've had an opportunity to serve people in, in their lowest times. And, uh, and there are a lot of rewards to that as well. Great. And, and now your, your current title is president of Gawlers. And tell us a little bit about Gawlers. I mean, it's for those that aren't familiar with it, right. it's, uh, renowned. How would you describe it? Funeral home or? Uh, yeah, it, J Joseph Gawler Sons. Um, originated in 1850. And as the title of the book states, it was one block west of the White House at that time. Uh, in 1962, they moved up onto Wisconsin Avenue right on the Chevy Chase uh, DC line. Uh, but the one thing really about Gawlers is it's in a very small group of the oldest continually operating businesses in Washington, DC. When you figure they've been around since 1850, there's not a lot of other businesses that can actually say that. Um, but it, it, over the years, because of where they were positioned, they became the funeral home that served a lot of prominent, um, a lot of times government officials such as US presidents, vice presidents, Congress, the Supreme Court. So throughout the country, uh, Gullers became notorious in, in the profession. Uh, and that really began when they, 
handled the services of John F. Kennedy. That really put them on the map as far as the funeral industry is concerned. Uh, and they just have had that reputation and still to this day serve. Uh, not only you know high government officials, we, we consider everyone that uh, is called upon us to serve is that they are a VIP at that time for us. Great. Now, out of curiosity, what precipitated the move one block from the White House up Wisconsin Avenue, I presume, where you're located right now? Yeah, I, you know, and I'm told that back in the early 60s, this was kind of the wilderness up here <laughs> compared to downtown. Uh, I think it really, it ended up being a case where it was so congested down there um, that it did, you know, it was more practical to move out here into the suburbs at the time. Um, and I, I bet that money had something to do with it too. Oh yeah, I would, I would, be, yeah. I would guess that yeah. as well. So, yeah. um, great. Okay. So now tell us what, what led to, what, what led to you writing this book? And, uh, okay. that's a good question. Uh, when I came to Gollers 10 years ago, uh, I knew about, you know, their prominence and all, but there was nothing here to signify that nothing had really been written down. I mean, I, I, I searched for, I went through old files and, uh, and then along in, in 2018, the company decided to renovate the facility. And in doing so, um, there was a, a magazine, a high quality funeral trade magazine that interviewed me and, and did a whole feature story on Gawlers and all. And, and the, the lady that interviewed me, who ends up being the co-author of my book, Alice Adams, uh, she's a journalist in Austin, Texas. She said, Dwayne, she says, there's a story to be written here. She says, I would love to write this book, a book with you. And I said, well, I've never written anything like that in my life. She said, I will work with you. We will. So, and then along came the pandemic just a few short months after that. And it literally gave me the opportunity to evenings when I had nothing to do, I would do my research and I would type and I, I would put together a chapter on a particular subject. I'd send it to her. She was kind of my grammar and spelling and, and she would give me tips and pointers on certain words you don't use or, you know, and, uh, and it just, but it, over a two and a half year period, it evolved into the book, uh, which um, I'm very proud of. Great. Uh, Dwayne Gawler's wasn't always a funeral home though. How did well, it, start? originally he was a cabinet maker in 1850. He was 21 years old. He, uh, he and his, parents had come over from England. He was just a small child at the time. And, uh, and the parents died a couple of years after they were here. They, got, they were orphaned, he and three of his siblings. And so he got apprenticed out and he ended up picking up the trade of cabinet making. So that, that yeah, he built furniture, but they built coffins and caskets. And then that just slowly evolved into, you know, more levels of service, literally dealing with the deceased rather than just providing the casket or coffin He's a but regular then it, that, that was in 1850 i'm sorry a regular horatio algier story yeah and then in okay. 1870 they they came up with the idea of building a funeral home uh, where people would come to the funeral home rather than having the funerals and the wakes in their private homes uh, mm. and that whole concept really caught on in this country and then that's why a lot of people refer to them as funeral parlors because originally the funeral was held in the parlor of the person's home can you tell us how how um, this celebration of life has evolved over time? How have traditions changed? How has Gawlers changed from one block west of the White House to Wisconsin Avenue? Yeah, I mean, years ago, the traditional, uh, the wake was held in the home. Uh, like I said, the casket and the body would be in the parlor. People would assemble there at the house and then Typically, the body would be taken to the either a church for a service or straight to the cemetery. Um, and it was more of a, you know, everything was draped in black. And, and but nowadays, as the traditions change, uh, like here at Gawler's, when we did our renovation, for sure, I said, we need to get rid of these heavy old dark drapes and take up the old dark red carpet and open the windows and let the sunlight in. People feel better when the sun shines on them. So. Um, and it went from more of a, you know, I'll say a religious service type to an atmosphere of more of a, uh, 
a reception. People get together, we serve food, uh, drinks, uh, music, you know, uplifting. Um, it, it's changed a lot. It's, you don't see, you know, it used to be in a visitation, people would come to the funeral home and they'd all sit in rows of chairs and sit there in silence. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's a celebration of the person's life. People, we encourage people to speak, talk about the person. We've gone away from the more structured, you know, it used to be everyone had the same type of service. You know, you had a certain amount of time that you had awake and then you had this service and you went to the cemetery. Uh, and, and I can remember times when, you know, let's say a minister or someone speaking would get up and, and they wouldn't even mention the person's name. You know, it was like, no, this is a celebration of this person's life. We need to talk about the person uh, that's represented in that. So, yeah, a lot of change. And I've been doing this now 40 some years and uh, it's it doesn't look anything like it used to. It's and it's all positive. It's a, it's a very move toward positivity. <laughs> Yeah, well, Susan and I literally were planning a live event there, and I remember it was just a few months before the pandemic, yeah, where we true. visited and we toured and we figured out where we're going to be, and it's been so long um, since, uh, well, uh, Susan had, a, had an event there. Well, I, I, I want, number one, I want to make sure that everybody in our, our audience today knows if you have any questions for Dwayne or just comments on this topic, feel free to throw them in there. Um, but I, I want to kind of, uh, I know this has been asked of you a million times, but the the whole JFK uh, thing, is there anything you can share with us about uh, about the JFK memorial or any of the, uh, some of the, the famous uh, folks that, have had services at Gawler's? Yeah, let, let me, uh, on the JFK story, um, we actually have a room here at the funeral home. It's called the Red Room. It's, it's where his casket bearers, his military casket bearers staged themselves and all. And, um, but the, the thing I wanted to talk about was when the assassination occurred, um, obviously there was, you know, there, there was no plan in place. And, Bobby Kennedy apparently, you know, was speaking to the military district of Washington, the person in charge, and he wanted the Navy to handle everything. He did not want a civilian funeral home involved. And they kept telling him, no, you need, you need a funeral home. You need Gallers. Gallers has this experience. Gallers had buried several presidents prior to that. And, uh, but it's interesting because there was a book uh, called uh, The American Way of Death, Jessica Mitford. It was released in 1962, and it was a, it was a scathing uh, uh, expose on funeral service. And he had read that, apparently, and, I, and really felt like they didn't want that involvement. But uh, thankfully, uh, this individual was able to turn that around. And uh, so that was Gawler's involvement was a result of that. And, and it was a late night here at Gawler's, <laughs> right down to, like, they needed a flag. And, you know, Gallers was able to pull that off and get them a flag. Uh, I, I know that at the, at the East Room of the White House, uh, Mr. Joseph Hagen, who worked here at Gallers at the time, he kind of led the whole team that evening. And he was asked to put a, a PT-109 pin on the president's lapel. And so when he did that and the casket was closed, that was the, the last time, you know, the casket was not reopened. There, there's been a lot of conspiracy theories and all, but, uh, and then another interesting thing is in our basement here at Gallers, we have these two old metal crypts in the wall and literally uh, the casket that Kennedy was sent from Dallas to here that was damaged and not used was actually stored in that crypt for a few months before it was taken to the National Archives. And eventually, uh, most people don't realize this, but that casket was sank in the ocean um, off Rehoboth Beach. So there's a lot of interesting, but you know, I get I get phone calls all the time, like get questions about the Kennedy funeral. I I was five years old. Okay, <laughs> I'm the wrong one to ask about at that moment, but uh, it, it does still have a lot of interest in people that uh, are interested in history and they want to know that behind the scenes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What really happened? You know. It's, 
You, you, you have a museum, do you not? I, I'm sorry? You have a museum. Yes, we did. In our renovation, we built it. We call it the Founders Room. Uh, but I, I was able through all that to reconnect with uh, about 40 descendants of Joseph Dollar. Uh, and amazingly enough, they had artifacts and paperwork and photographs, which also really aided in, in my book because uh, it was just some astounding stuff that they gave me. And then you know, once I connected with him, I, the oldest scholar lives in Jacksonville, Florida. I went there and actually interviewed him uh, prior to the pandemic and uh, got some great uh, information from him. And uh, just the other day, about three weeks ago, I went and presented him with his copy of the book. Um, I wanted, I was on my bucket list to literally hand it to him in person. So, wow. Um, Natalie has an interesting comment and question. She says, in England, the Duchess of Devonshire, one of the Mitford sisters of literary fame, was, I believe, buried in a wicker biodegradable casket. You just mentioned her sister, Jessica. Yeah. The British ones I've seen are lovely, though I'd be in no hurry to need one. Yeah. <laughs> they, must, they must exist in the US. Do these exist? Yes, the yes, they do. And typically, uh, that would be referred to as maybe like a green burial. Uh, there is a cemetery here in D.C., Old Congressional Cemetery, that does green burials. Uh, it's a fairly new concept in the last few years. Uh, but yeah, we've used some wicker baskets here. And it's interesting because years ago, back in, I'm going to say the 30s and 40s, it was a wicker basket uh, that a funeral director would take to the home, let's say, to, to pick up a, a deceased and bring it back to the funeral home. It was kind of in place of a gurney you know, or a stretcher. Yeah, yeah, they're very much available. Oh, interesting. Oh, and let's see, Jeff Arnett has his hand raised. Sometimes people do that by accident. But Jeff, if you would like to ask a question, just open your mic up and um, uh, and ask away. The uh, Jeff? Yeah. The question I have is that uh, my grandfather on my mom, Tom side was a stone sculptor for cemeteries. And uh, he had a couple of, you know, different sizes that he would come up with. Do people still do that as a chosen profession? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, you know, the thing is, there, there are professionals, like, let's say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use Barry Vermont as an example. Uh, where they still do carving and, and whatnot, you know, with literally with pneumatic tools, air tools and all. Uh, the typical monument dealer around the United States, uh, if there's something very specialized like that, they would job that out, you know, to an in industry person. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, people still have some very ornate uh, monuments. There, there's a monument that was just set in Oak Hill Cemetery here in Georgetown that is very interesting. The gentleman was an architect himself that passed and uh, you get a chance to go there. It's it's directly, when you go in the gate, you just walk straight back, but it's a very interesting, very contemporary piece, which doesn't quite fit the aesthetics of the cemetery, but it'll definitely draw attention. I stumbled well, upon a Rodin at the cemetery in Middleburg. Don't ask me why I was walking through the cemetery in Middleburg, but you learn so much about history going through those areas. That's how I learned about the, the Spanish flu. I kept seeing all these dates of 1917, 1918, 1917, 1918, yeah. and I learned about the flu. But uh, there is this beautiful, beautiful bronze uh, of a Madonna and child that was done by Rodin. I was marveled over that. So you, you, you mentioned the Spanish flu. Uh, because we were in the middle of the pandemic, I, one day I'm thinking, I should go check the records from 1918 and perhaps write a chapter about that, which I ended up doing. And it was quite a revelation about how many people that Gaulers, not to mention all the other funeral establishments in the city were handling. Because a lot of, you know, we were end of World War One, soldiers were coming back and people, I mean, the age that these people were passing was it was pretty sad, really, to see, 
you know, I, there were times when dollars might get 20 or 30 death calls in one day. I, I don't even know how they managed that. Um, but that, you know, it, it just, it just seemed relevant with what we had going on, you know, at the time I was writing. Yeah, you're the, you're the only person I know that calls me Thursdays before three to say, I'm not going to make it today. Generally, it's because of RBG. Uh, it's your, your absence is preceded by headlines and news flashes, news bulletins. Can you speak a little bit about some of the notables? I know you have traveling teams too, don't you? Yes, our company has a, a travel team that typically, like if it's a former president to say, and they're coming to be, you know, to lie in state in the rotunda, uh, here in our building, I'll get 10 or 15 people converge uh, from all around the country uh, to help us execute that service. Uh, it, it, I usually end up, I have to play host to all those people. So you got to feed them, you know, and keep them, keep them with everything they need. But one of the biggest things is vehicles, uh, having enough vehicles. Sometimes we might have 15, 16 vehicles on a high profile service. And what people don't realize is at the end of the day, all those vehicles have got to be cleaned and ready for the next day. Uh, all I can say is we don't get very much sleep during those high profile calls. And I know other funeral homes around the country, they look at that and they think it's all glamorous. It's a lot of hard work and a lot of stress, but uh, we feel privileged to be a part of that. Wasn't Gawler the one to start the concept of the lights on for the funeral procession? Well, that's what, you know, there's, certain amount of folklore out there, but yes, uh, you know, when you went from horse carriages, horse-drawn hearses to motorized, Bellers had the first motorized hearse in 1912 in DC. And with headlamps and all, they decided, and they went to the police department and said, you know, maybe a good way to signify that we're in a funeral procession, procession is to have our lights on. So they kind of get credit for that. Uh, and then it, it, you know, it obviously moved across the country as well as, when motorized vehicles came into being. Yep. Um, I would like for you to speak a little bit about the gorgeous artwork that you have done by the young woman who actually sustained, she was a horsewoman, she's a funeral director, right? And she sustained yes. a brain injury and in occupational therapy and rehab. How many portraits did she do? Well, I think we're up to about 42 now. Um, we have a room in our remodeled project. It's, it's a place for gathering for receptions, uh, either during a, you know, during a visitation or after a service. And it, it's a, like a dark paneled room, but it has, a, it has a stationary bar and all and a place for serving food. But around the room, you'll find portraits of famous Americans that have passed through Gawler's uh, service at one point or another. So she painted all of these portraits for me using uh, Elmer's or yeah, Elmer's blue and paint, and, and they're absolutely stunning. <laughs> uh, so it, each time, you know, she's actually at since our open house, she's added three or four to my collection here. But uh, she's very interesting, interesting person. She's a funeral director in Richmond, Virginia. Well, she's those, are, those are beautiful. Uh, yeah, I mean, she really and she put those out in a record amount of time too because. We were up against the open house when I discovered she could do that for us and the actual open house. And, and, she, and then they were shipped. They were all sent away to be framed alike. And so by the time they all came back, it was just in time for the open house. It's amazing. Um, Patricia Dubroff uh, from Assisting Hands, she uh, had you hosted you for one of her book clubs. Yes. Uh, says she was impressed with the story Dwayne tells about how in these times of mass shootings, the funeral homes around the country support each other. And she mentions how, how kind you were to her and her group. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, uh, tell us a little bit about- uh, Well, I, I, I will tell you, you know, just with this, um, uh, with Nuvaldi, Texas, uh, there are only two, two, you know, small, relatively small funeral homes in that town. And I know that, uh, funeral homes all around the state of Texas offered their assistance to those firms. Um, and it's, it's kind of amazing. Uh, they just, you know, sometimes funeral homes are very competitive, 
but in times like that, um, you know, a human being can only take so much and having to deal in that case with all the children, you know, that, that's just, uh, that would be a drain on anyone in the profession to have to deal with those circumstances. And it's nice to know that the professional colleagues will step in to help. That happens a lot. And, um, that that's wonderful. Uh, Todd, when we were talking about the, um, uh, the, the paintings that the artist did was, uh, said, you know, it'd be great to see those is, are people able to schedule an appointment to pop by and yes. get a tour of callers? Yeah, absolutely. I, I will tell you, I give several tours a week. Uh, typically it's a funeral director vacationing or coming to DC for a reason, maybe Arlington National Cemetery to do a burial. Yes, uh, we invite people to come by, get a hold of us ahead of time. Sometimes they just pop in if we're available. You know, I've got an entire like funeral home tour that I do that spells out a lot of the history. And yeah, it, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's interesting how many people actually, like next week, the National Funeral Directors Association's in Baltimore. And I already have the week pretty well filled up with people that have contacted me and said, hey, we're gonna be in Baltimore, we'd like to. And on Tuesday night, I have a group of 45 funeral directors coming. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just amazing because Gallers is just that well known amongst the profession. That, you great. will allow people to use your rooms too. They're they're available for for rent. Oh yeah. Right? Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. Somebody's we, hosting there. If I'm not mistaken, somebody is going to be hosting his 90th birthday there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is what I would say about Gallers. And you know, when I was a kid growing up, you walked into a funeral home, all you smelled was flowers, and you know, there's there just a certain look, right? Gallers is not that look or not that smell or anything. I mean, you you would basically when you realize you're in a funeral home per se, if you were here for any other reason, you hopefully you would just in, enjoy our decor and uh, the woodwork, the wallpaper, yeah, yeah just the ice everything. In our room. Hey, right. You know, uh, Dwayne, I I know this this might be hard. Oh, let's see. Uh, B BH has a question about water cremation, aquamotion. Any? Yeah, I mean, there's some new new things coming down the pike. Um, they're not real prevalent in this area yet. It's mostly on the West Coast. We have like composting, uh, hydrolysis, I believe is what she's referring to. Um, those are all things that a lot of the states are weighing, you know, whether or not they're going to allow that. I think it's Washington and Oregon that have composting now. Uh, I was just contacted recently by a local clergy in, uh, in D.C. and they were mortified because they had read a story about that. And, you know, I just I kept my comments kind of neutral on it. But I think you'll see that uh, people just, you know, options. It's anymore. It's all about the options. Uh, you know, people are looking for, you know, what they would consider the, like the green burials or, you know, where chemicals are not used or, you know, a cremation creates a certain amount of carbon. You know, I just, it's all relevant to what's going on in our world these days. Um, can you pr give us a little for the folks that aren't in your field, is there like a Cliff Notes version of somebody passes away let's either in the hospital or at home and what what happens next i i know i've heard some talks on this and it's kind of surprising like so for example the um you know i always sort of felt like you immediately had to get that body to the funeral home and and i've heard some different uh different viewpoints on that topic yeah yeah you know when i was a young funeral director <laughs> you know i thought i had to be there like instantly and uh and, and then i over the years i think well where's the person gonna go right until i get there uh but a lot of it depends on sometimes you know a family people may be on their way to arrive they know death is near and they want to get there person passes you know we're still waiting for other family members to come if it's an unattended death you know you have to involve the authorities uh, 
they call 911, the police come, you know, and, and then they contact the medical examiner. And a lot of times if the person's under some type of medical care, the medical examiner may just, you know, waive having to be involved in it. Uh, you need a doctor that's going to agree to sign a cause of death on a certificate. Uh, but we have, you know, we're on call 24 hours a day. So uh, we try to judge that, you know, we would speak to either maybe a hospice nurse if they're involved or the family directly. And they might say, well, can you give us three more hours or something? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there is no real urgency unless the urgency is with the family. If the family says, can you come as quick as possible? Sure. Uh, the thing about, you know, being in a metropolitan area, there is nothing about traveling quick. <laughs> And I think most people realize that and, uh, you know, allow us the time it takes to get there. If it's two in the morning, we got to, you know, we've got to get up ourselves. We don't just sit up all night. So, yes, yeah, so there's no, the urgency is really not there. I think years ago it was more urgent, not so much anymore. So then, like, so, so then from the, the point of death, um, the, the body is now, transferred directly into our to, care into your care and then what what happens there well it depends on whether you know a person is has opted for cremation or if they want burial uh, the family has you know the decision to make whether the body be prepared or embalmed as we call it um, if if not you know within a certain number of hours uh, like in the district of columbia a person has to be in refrigeration which we have can accommodate that here at our facility we usually try to, you know, set an appointment uh, that works best for the family to come in and we just sit down and try to build that relationship with them. And I always said, you know, the reward I've always gotten out of this profession is I can meet a stranger at the door and maybe two hours later, they're calling me by my first name. That, that means I've connected and you know, I've done something to help them through a difficult time. One of my, one of my biggest pet peeves are Every once in a while, we'll run into someone who literally doesn't understand why they have to come in and meet with us. <laughs> it's like, okay, there is paperwork involved here, you know, whether it's a cremation authorization or for burial or information for the death certificate. And I've had them actually say before, like, how long is this going to take? Well, it may be an hour and a half or so. Well, you have exactly one hour of our time. And I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, to me, that's crazy. It's like, Okay, how, how many nights did your mother sit up all night with you with an ear infection? You know, it's like you can't give her more than an hour. It's just uh, that's our society. Oh, we're on we're on such a fast pace. But uh, yeah, we would have an arrangement conference, and then you know we if someone's going to be cremated for sure, we we ask that the someone representing the family or a family member do a physical ID so that cremation is irreversible. So we got to make sure we have it right every time the first time. And we have all kinds of checks and balances, chains of custody and everything, but we need someone to lay eyes on, you know, so the, the body is somewhat prepared in a container for the cremation or someone can say, yes, that's so-and-so. And, -so, and uh, then we can move forward once we have the legal paperwork. Okay. Which requires a death certificate and, uh, you know, in DC, we have to involve the medical examiner to give us permission also to cremate. Now, is there a period of time? So let's, let's say that the the body leaves the home goes to gallers and could months go by where before you cremate or prepare the body or is there some sort of immediacy that needs to be in, in some in some cases uh, we do hold the body for several months it's typically it's for arlington burial arlington national cemetery in those cases, we, we highly recommend that an embalming has taken place, but the, the body would have to be kept in refrigeration. And so, yes, we do hold bodies sometimes for, you know, and, and sometimes to be honest with you, locating the proper family members to authorize something, we run into issues there. It's, it's not all just cut and dry. I mean, there are many difficult, I'll call them difficult cases only in just sorting out who has the authority uh, what was the person's wishes? What if someone's trying to like go against those wishes? Or we get into situations where family members are feuding. Uh, you know, sometimes we're, we're kind of like the arbitrator in the middle. Uh, sometimes we have to, you know, refer to the legal department just to sort out 
who really has the authority and uh, yeah sometimes it's you know it's kind of sad in in those moments that you have to go to those extremes but it definitely just that's the real world <laughs> well definitely an emotionally charged time now it is. Uh, what what is the general definition of embalming uh like what is involved it's the disinfection and preservation of the body is what it is and it's through a chemical process you inject a chemical that removes moisture out of the body so formaldehyde is used because that's uh, formaldehyde attaches to water molecules so as the as the liquid goes through the body and it passes from the arteries to the veins it goes through the capillaries the tiny little arteries and that's where moisture is pulled out of the cells and then it exits the body. So that's that's why a body starts to feel firm is because basically you're removing the moisture and the more moisture you re remove, you know, the more preservation uh, is accomplished. But, that's, that's the elementary bit. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, we, we just need the Cliff Notes version, but embalming yeah. is not required. So some, no. somebody could uh, pass away, be, um, on ice, so to speak, and then uh, cremated or, Buried or cremated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Certain religions do not require embalming. Correct. Yeah, like the in the Jew the Jewish folks a lot of times do not choose embalming. Um, Muslims a lot of times do not choose embalming, but there's there's also a lot of Gentiles that don't. I mean, and then you know, obviously. Cremation is like the new, I don't want to say new trend because it's been around a while, but it, it's a pretty high percentage here in the metropolitan area. It's in the high 50 some percent um, where if you go out to like, let's say in Texas where I was, it was like 8%. It, it really just depends on the area of the country. Different traditions. Uh, yeah. with, with regard, let's take this a little bit lighter now because I know in, in terms of celebrating life, I'd like to get back on that topic since you're responsible for the final appearance, the last chance people will see their loved ones. And I know you've gone out of your way above and beyond on several occasions. Can you speak to some of those moments? You've shared several with me, if you'd share with our, our listeners. Sure. Um, I had an opportunity once when I was meeting with uh, the two daughters of a gentleman that had passed and he was a businessman and they all had worked together in the same office same company and they were just we were just talking i was trying to build a rapport with them and they were telling me about how you know the memory they had was that every morning their father would come to the office with the uh, wall street journal and the washington post under his arm and he'd go in his office and sit in there for the first hour or so reading the newspaper so i didn't say anything to him but the day they came in to see him for the first time I, I got both those newspapers and I rolled them up and I tucked them under his arm. And, um, they were just blown away with, you know, the fact that I had listened to what they were saying. Mm -hmm. And I made, I made a memory out of that or, you know, brought back a, a good memory. Another time too, we had a young person and the grandmother, I heard the grandmother say, you know, I'll never forget because every time we went out to dinner, he ordered an Arnold Palmer. He loved an Arnold Palmer. And so I got a hold of our caterer. And when we had our visitation, I had him set up like two or three stations in the building where we served Arnold Palmer's, you know, I put a little sign there. This was his favorite drink. So I always tell the, you know, the staff is always be listening to because you want to make a memorable moment. You want to, you want to give them something. Um, and, and, you know, to uplift them rather than it to be somber and all. And even in the worst circumstances, you can find things and ways to do that. Um, yeah, that, those are, you know, just some little things that um, help make the whole picture better. That's, that's wonderful. Um, uh, BH has a uh, question. It, it was hope, hoping you could give a recommendation about a local stone carving company for creating a burial stone with a specific artistic design. Uh, is it best for them to just reach out to you directly? Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I can give them something on that. Okay, great. Now, you know, I... Um, I had uh, used to teach at UMBC and we had a chapter 
in this aging studies course that I that I uh, taught on death and dying. And one of the uh, one of the college students did a Google search uh, and shared with us. I don't know if it's a new trend, but it, what triggered this memory was talking about the Wall Street Journal and the Arnold Palmer. But what he shared with us is, is that there's this trend of folks sort of being posed um, in like riding a motorcycle or sitting at the kitchen table. Uh, have, have you seen this type of memorial and any thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I've definitely seen it in the news or in like a trade magazine and all. Um, anything is possible. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 the thing that always amazed me is years ago, they used to photograph these people, you know, they would stand them up somehow or sit them in a certain way. They were death, you know, post-mortem photography. And it always amazes me how they got these people to be in those positions and remain there long enough to take a picture because, you know, a body weighs a certain amount of weight and you don't, you know, if you're, if you're not using your own muscles to hold yourself up, I mean, I, that always amazed me, but yeah, there was a, there was a article once where a gentleman owned a Mercedes Benz. Uh, he, he died rather young, but he wanted this car. So they literally put him in the car and they buried him, the car and he in the grave, you know, and then, the monument was literally a full-size chunk of granite carved out as his car, the Mercedes. Wow. So yeah, I mean, anything is possible. It's just uh, well, sometimes think, it's controversial too. Yeah, I think that when the uh, when the student sort of brought this to the class's attention, it really piqued a lot of curiosity and a lot of questions in terms of, wow, is that legal? And what we discovered is that there's a lot of things, preconceptions that we have about burials and what right. you need to do, like six feet under and all this and being in a casket yeah. where, like you just sort of said, hey, uh, well, you want to be buried in a car, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, exactly. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, you know, in the old days, people, there was just, you know, the traditional way of you, this is the way you did it. You had the death call came in. You know, what day do you want your visitation? The funeral's the next day. Where's the cemetery? I mean, it's like, it's not that way anymore. I mean, sometimes we, a family might put us off for a week, let's say, before they even want to meet with us. It, it has changed so much. It's just, you never, you really don't know what it's going to turn out like until it happens. It's, uh, yeah. Damianti just mentioned that in Ghana, people much, much, much in advance talk about planning, they can select the vehicle with which they choose to be transported at end of life. Right. I, well, I, I think I think Queen Elizabeth had her vehicle, that vehicle was made specifically to, to that hearse was to carry her. Is she, like she, she designed she it or something. She design, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess when you have the money, you could do that, right? I, I don't think I'll be doing that. What about yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it, we're going a little bit lighter, and this is a good thing. Can can you talk about some of the lighter moments and maybe some pet peeves? Or uh, yeah. now's the time to share. <laughs> yeah, I could. I, there's a couple uh, maybe funny things I could. Um, there was a time I was working a funeral. This was up in upstate New York, and when we come out of the church, we would always like I would we would tell the driver of the first car, you go down like to the end of the next block and just pull off. And then when the hearse comes by, you'll fall right in behind the hearse. Well, <laughs> we had this funeral going and all of a sudden, and I didn't see it, but a hearse from another funeral home just happened to be traveling down the street. <laughs> and when he got down past that line of cars, the guy in the first car did exactly what I told him to do, follow the hearse. So he takes my funeral procession and he's going down this street. <laughs> he discovers that, oh, I think I just picked up all these cars behind me with their headlights on. So he pulled over and told him, you know, you got the wrong hearse. So that was, uh, that was <laughs> one. Rerouted? Yeah. So, and then there was another time I was doing a graveside service and I, the, um, the gentleman that died, his brother and I were fairly good friends. We were business in, you know, in the same town. 
And he and his wife and the widow were there. And we were at the cemetery. It was just the four of us. And he says, Dwayne, he says, can you say some words or say something? And I said, well, why don't we, why don't we recite the 23rd Psalm? So they said, yeah, that's great. So we started out and we're going down through the 23rd Psalm. And all of a sudden, somewhere in the middle, we switched over to the Lord's Prayer. And all of a sudden, after two or three lines, it dawned on us like, oh, my gosh, we just intertwined these two scripture passages and we all burst out laughing. And they, they thought that was hilarious. And his brother would have loved that and all. And, and we, we laughed about that till, um, till we were practically crying, I think. But um, yeah, there are light moments once in a while. You have to know when the right time is to um, seize the moment. But then there's nightmare moments too, okay? I, I dealt, and when I was in Texas, I had three funeral homes I was in charge of there. And I got a phone call from one of them and they were getting ready to have a visitation. And apparently when they were getting this person ready, they had brought in the woman's 50th anniversary dress. And it was this green dress all sequined and everything and all. And apparently they cut it to put it on her, but they put it, on backwards they cut it so that it was cut up the front and i had the the daughter and the granddaughter were just ballistic and it was 20 miles away i got in the car i rushed up there uh it was it was time for the family to have their friends come in and we ended up putting a scarf around it but i sat for a half an hour and patted this woman on the back of the hand apologizing and taking ownership of it um that was not such a happy moment. Those are very stressful things happen, uh, but I was able to divert that from a possible lawsuit. To <laughs> All's them. well that ends well, literally. Yeah, I ended up kind of understanding where we were with it, but uh, yeah, there are those moments that are like out of your control or you know, you're only as good as your best or your worst uh, employee too, right? So. Yeah, you well, learn a lot. Do you have nightmares about that? I bet you do. I have, you know, I have a reoccurring nightmare. <laughs> I don't know if it's a nightmare, but it's troubling. I have this dream that I'm at the front door of the funeral home. The people that are, that are coming into the funeral home are knocking on the door. I'm standing there in my pajamas and I turn around and look and the body's not ready. I mean, I'm, not, I'm nowhere near ready for them to come in yet or anything. And that just, that's a very troubling one. Uh, and, and another one, I'll go just a little further uh, bizarre, but a lot of times down through the years, you know, you might be up 48 plus hours just based on business and you get tired. You know, you're like any other human being, you're wore out. And that's usually when I would really have the bizarre dreams. But I had this dream that I was in a competitor's preparation room and there were tables all, and there were bodies laying all over the tables covered in sheets and I'm trying to do an embalming. And then all of a sudden I turn and one of the bodies sits up and spins around, looks at me and says, when's it my turn? <laughs> That's a nightmare. <laughs> okay. Uh, so those are some a little lighter moments. Um, you need those too, though. That I've experienced. Yeah, it's, uh, I didn't talk about them in the book really, but. Uh, <laughs> I love that story. Well, how about the words? Well, you know, I'm big on words. Talk about the words that we use and I remember your son's description of uh, uh, take uh, take your child to work day. Yeah, I yeah, my oldest son when he was probably in third grade, I think it was. Uh, they had the day when they had to get up in front of the class and tell them what your parents do for a living, and, and he got up there and his interpretation of what I did for a living was that I drove people to heaven, uh, and and the teacher told us that later, and she thought that was so sweet that he had said that, but. Yeah, words really do matter. And, you know, we have a lot. I, there again, as a young funeral director, I remember, I'm going to call him Mr. Smith. That really wasn't his name. But, you know, here I am. I'm an apprentice at this point, And he's coming in to make funeral arrangements. And when he got to the door and he came in, I asked him how he was. I said, you know, how are you, Mr. Smith? And he just, he lit into me. He said, how do you think I am? I just lost my wife of 54. I mean, it was, I learned a lesson there that the words really do matter and you have to be very careful and sensitive to, you know, I wasn't the one having a bad day. He was you know, mm -hmm. so, and, you know, a lot of times, well, Susan, your, your one term is the circle of life. I, I like that where you're connecting the ends mm -hmm. uh, to celebrate someone's life. And, 
here at Gollers, we use terms like life well celebrated or um, those are some of the, you know, the buzzwords the rather go than- The ceremony, going home service. Yeah, rather than the saying African a funeral American or- community is fairly common. Yeah, we even get away from the word visitation and we call it a gathering. I mean, it's, you know, we changed the name of our chapel. Uh, we had, I had named the chapel after Mr. Joseph Hagen, who was the funeral doctor in charge of Kennedy's funeral and Eisenhower's funeral. And uh, we named it uh, in his honor and then, but it had Memorial Chapel. We, we just took chapel and we changed it to Grand Hall. Now it's more of a multi-purpose realm. It, it doesn't have to be or have a religious connotation to it. It certainly can if you want it to, but it can also be, you know, we can set up tables and chairs and, and host a meal in there if that's what the family wants. Yeah, we've become very diversified in the type of services that are available. I personally call your gathering room the wine bar. I have, I think it has a nicer ring yeah. <laughs> with all the artwork. Earlier, uh, I know we're coming up on time. Earlier, you made reference to often being a mediator when families are at odds. They can't, they can't seem to, they're under stress. They can't seem to get it together. They don't, uh, they're not on the same page with how they want to pr uh, progress. And I know that this can be particularly true in, in some cultures. Uh, I think we have, I, I don't know if Veronica, uh, can't, Kanan is on with us from the Roundhouse. Veronica, are you with us? There is, a, she's here. Okay, if we can get her on camera, uh, is that possible, Steve? Uh, yeah, hold on a sec okay. here. I know that um, because these rituals and traditions are what make us as individuals and in turn, make us as families, define our, our uh, familial cultures, and it also becomes our, our tradition, our history. And the Roundhouse Theater is speaking specifically to this with Nine Nights. And I know that uh, I'll let uh, Veronica talk to you about that, share some information. Uh, would you share the information on Nine Night, Veronica? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity, Susan. I really appreciate it. Um, so Roundhouse's current production, uh, which is only playing through this Sunday, uh, that is the closing performance. So there's a couple more opportunities. Um, Nine Night is by a playwright named Natasha Gordon, and she is uh, British Jamaican. Um, and this is the U.S. premiere uh, of the play. Uh, it was a big hit on the West End in London, and Natasha was the first uh, a uh, black female British playwright to be produced on the on the West End uh, in 2018, which is really exciting. Um, but the play follows a family and uh, their their family matriarch uh, Gloria passes away, and it is um, all of the all of the family uh, struggles and laughs and things that happen uh, when someone in the family passes. And uh, the tradition of nine night um, is a Jamaican tradition that uh, for nine nights they. Uh, essentially party and celebrate uh, the life of the person that that has passed and it is um, it is very joyful and it is uh, if you think about you know an Irish wake it is it is that for for nine nights so there is a lot of alcohol involved and you know the neighbors are coming over it's not just family it's sort of everybody um, and so the play follows all of what is happening uh, with the family and the trials and tribulations um, that are happening but it is also very uh, in many ways, very joyful um, to to see, you know, this family and that there's the way in which that tradition celebrates life. Um, also, uh, Dwayne very wonderfully is serving on a panel um, discussion that we are having at Roundhouse. It's this coming Saturday, October 8th, uh, following the two o'clock matinee performance about celebrating life and death. Um, so we'll also have a grief counselor as well as the artistic director of the DC Jazz Festival um, to talk about uh, different ways of finding peace and comfort during those moments of transition uh, in life, which, you know, can be difficult, but we want to find the joy in that. So I'll put some information in the chat, um, as well as a discount code if anybody wants to come see the show um, and my contact information. But uh, we'd love to see you uh, Roundhouse for this beautiful play and to come here, uh, Dwayne, talk some more about uh, the work that that he does. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. And thank you for agreeing to be there, Dwayne. So do we have any other parting notes on which, what did, I'd like to hear from the group. What did they think? I, I can see in the chat that the comments are, are largely positive. The, uh, the idea from Thursday at three, of course, is to allow you to reflect, to invite you to comment, 
hopefully relax and learn something and to leave you smiling. So to that end, I hope we're doing that. Are we not? Okay. Comments, uh, Dwayne, any parting comments? I go back to uh, that when they told me I was on the call for the rest of my life. <laughs> Now, the book is actually giving me a lot of opportunities to talk about Gallers, talk about my profession, um, and I appreciate that. I'm just, just going to hold it like that so you can see this. I call it the mini Hamilton, okay? Yeah. It is one heavy book. <laughs> it weighs three pounds, <laughs> which I'm not quite sure why it weighs so much. It must be the weight of the paper. but uh, It's hard back, and it's, it's heavy paper. But yeah, I, I thank um, you for that. But I thank you. I thank you both for this opportunity to speak to it and to speak to my profession and to speak to callers. Um, and and don't don't forget to go uh, contact Dwayne. Go and visit the museum. It's a, a local landmark. And yeah, I'm sure we have a, lots of stories for you. I defer yeah, to you, Steve. Thank you for this opportunity. I, I think this has been fantastic and uh, glad that we can promote also promote your appearance at the uh, Roundhouse Theater. So um well thank uh, you susan I'll what do you, you think my final words as we close thursday at three and we will also close the uh positive aging community with the same concept that our potential for improvement is infinite and we're better together thank you thank you everyone for joining us <laughs>